Fairness in the costs and the benefits of climate mitigation actions is so central to building public support, but also to ensuring that there is policy stability, which is really what is required across the public and the private sector for some of the long-term investments that the green transition overall requires. But fundamentally, unless there is fairness in the costs and the benefits of climate mitigation actions, we're likely to see pushback. Um, to what is really required right now, which is an acceleration of climate action to make sure um, that our goal, global goals for keeping temperature rises to 1.5 degrees and less are really within sight. food systems as they are currently configured are not delivering to the farmers, primary producers as much as they should. How is it possible that those that are responsible for feeding the world themselves are the most undernourished? At the bottom of the chain where the farmers sit, that's where the greatest risk is also sitting. But you then get the lowest return. And as you go up the chain, the risk profile decreases and the value reward and reward actually increases. The other part really is that farmers buy their inputs at retail price. 
And when they sell their produce, they sell at wholesale prices. Uh, we have a situation which is supposed to be the opposite. So it, I always say that farmers um, get the wrong end of the stick. Yes, collectively you are one big mass, but you are distributed widely geographically in the hinterland. So you are fragmented. With fragmented power, be it power in terms of your demand for inputs, be it power in terms of your supply inputs, you are not going to get that kind of horsepower, that kind of quantity to influence the discussions. It's not a contract of equals. It's a contract that um, um, wittingly or unwittingly gets dictated uh, to you uh, and it leaves farmers with not much of a choice. And guess what? When there is disaster relief, it goes mainly to consumers. Well, those are the most powerful, the most vocal in towns. And there is no um, sort of uh, assistance given in terms of the capital or assets that have been destroyed. I'm a firm believer of uh, technology as an instrument that can be deployed to address uh, the pain points. The moment you know what prices are obtaining um, instantly through in other areas or even around you, that information becomes powerful. It becomes the first point of defense when it comes to disaster management. If there's a, if there's, um, a storm, big storm coming or a cyclone, your first point of defense is information. So all that, so connectivity is so fundamental. It's not a luxury. If you are not connected, you are nothing. We are now dealing with agriculture that has become increasingly, increasingly complex. In many ways, it is science-based, it is data-driven, it is ICT-enabled, it is globalized, it is, it is constantly changing. It is now in the head than in the hands. So it now requires a different aptitude <laughs> to abstract and to deal with it. It's much more about strategy, about planning. It's no longer about working in the fields, producing a good crop. When they say make agricultural sexy, the sexiness is in a profitable enterprise that delivers the same quality of life as what the banking sector or the manufacturing sector does. When climate issues are talked about, it's much more about how can the farmers adapt and mitigate. <laughs> it is not about how can the entire chain behave. So if we can take a chain approach, and there could be creative ways of making everyone pay, that's the reason why people pay taxes, that's the reason why companies pay taxes. That could go towards funding. It's settling into a better equilibrium in a sense than what we were seeing last year when inflation was high or even year before last when inflation was even higher. So inflation has come down. And so you see that advanced economies are starting to think about growth again rather than inflation. So that part is good.
problem is that the growth that the world economy is settling into is much lower than what we saw in the 2000s. It's even lower than what we saw in the 2010s, which was lower than the beginning of this millennium. So in a sense, what's happening is that we've seen a step down in terms of growth from the first decade of this millennium to the second to the third. The big concern has to do with what we call secular stagnation. So which means slowing productivity growth and adverse demographics. I mean, essentially the aging of the population and declining labor force participation. That basically means that these countries have actually done reasonably well in growing into what we call middle income levels, which are somewhere between $1,500 and $15,000. But then instead of growing through these, uh, uh, through these middle income levels, they tend to stall in them. If you look at their per capita incomes over the last uh, decade or so, they have not grown at all. In fact, they might even have shrunk in some parts of the world. So we are worried that, that they are going into a period because the world economy is not doing nearly as well as it should, because their partners, their trading partners are not doing well, they might end up actually having very slow growth. And these are countries that actually have fairly high population growth rates. So as a result of it, as their growth rates fall and the population growth rates remain high, their per capita income levels fall. You actually continue to service your debt, but you divert money from other things. And the other things usually are education, health, investments in infrastructure and so on. And as a result of it, what happens is that the state of the people becomes poorer and the state of the economy gets worse. What gives me hope are countries like the United States, which have a very vibrant private sector. And I feel that the private sector will bail out the U.S. economy again and again. Uh, so I have a lot of confidence in it. What gives me hope also are countries like India and Indonesia, that these countries are actually doing very well. They could do even better, but they're doing rather well. And then what gives me hope is uh, that, you know, that even among the poor countries, the really poor countries, there's, there are always good examples that actually show the others that you can take really adverse circumstances. I mean, things like civil conflict and really bad geography and so on, and you can convert that into progress for girls, for boys, and for women, and for men, everybody. And I'm talking about countries like Rwanda.